maybe uh, the 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 last slides were like worried, and and I'd like to to start from here to to be then on 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 the light <laughs> on the light side and on on the happy and and bright side of of our future. He, we we feel some way I don't know way maybe it's the the financial crisis or uh, the recession are a net delusion. Uh, someone talks about this. Um, w w what you feel when what you can see in in the people you you study on uh, is this something that can slow the process of of innovation and and change or uh, the, ch the the innovation will go on but will be uh, feeling like. Uh, excluded in some way? People are worried. Uh, it, it, they are especially worried since 2008 and the beginning of the Great Recession. And you can just watch their fears and their concerns cascade through their lives. They are much more concerned about making sure their skills are relevant to the workforce. They're much more worried about the safety of their money and their investments. They're much more worried about their institutions. There's so much anger at the regulators who did not act in ways to soften the blow of the Great Recession. And so that's cool, right? That, well, it's, that's the way politics is, and, that, and that's, a, that's a good thing, although many cultures are still trying to figure out what the, what the right way to respond now is in the future. And yet, if you watch the march of technology, they are still enthusiastic about embracing new gadgets and new techniques. And so we have not seen any of the concern translated into enthusiasm for the internet, enthusiasm, all those lines, all of those increases in adoption, those were uninterrupted in many respects by, uh, by the, the Great Recession. And so people are very, ambivalent or have very mixed feelings about their technology. They worry about the things that I discussed, and yet in their day-to-day -day lives, they love their screens. They love their phones. They love the technology tools that many of the smart people in this room have built for them. And so it's very hard for policymakers to, to get a reading on this, to think, where, where should we place our emphasis? Where should we do, make our rules? But can we say somehow that uh, we do not understand fully? Uh, I'm not. I'm not that old, but I, I, I still think about uh, technology, and then what's inside is the internet. This is just a piece of something. Mm -hmm. uh, are we able to uh, distinguish? But no. No. Uh, the. And the technology community does a wonderful job of making things easier and easier for people to use. And so, there, again, from last night, there was this wonderful conversation about generational differences with technology, which are clear. As we look at who's the most enthusiastic and who's the most worried, it's young people who are the widest to embrace technologies, but who are the most worried about the future. It's, it's younger people. And I really liked uh, the, the part of the conversation last night where the generational differences stand out. They're in our data, so they're, and, and especially the global data, because uh, around the world, young people think that they have a special culture that's not necessarily national culture, it's global culture tied to the internet. But there is, a, there is a psychological dimension to this that doesn't apply to any age. If you ha are open, if you enjoy risk, if you want to be an early adopter of things, no matter what your age, you, you love these things and, and want to explore with them. But the technology community is also making it easier and easier just to embrace these things and, and put them in your lives. So there's sort of an uncritical um, acceptance of the technologies, even as people sort of have these um, concerns and these fears in the background. And, and that is the point where neutrality uh, should, should be part of, of the debate, but um, 
I think this somehow that that battle is is lost, don't you think so? Yeah. Well, I didn't put up in my uh, dark side uh, themes another theme that these experts and the, their international group of experts, and it was such an interesting common theme for them. They are worried that governments and powerful corporations are going to intervene in the open, free-flowing uh, in internet and make restrictions that are going to make it harder for us to share with each other, for ma uh, make it harder for us to innovate and, and make tools um, on this. And you can see this already around the world where cultures assert themselves. And oftentimes they do that not for sinister reasons, sometimes they are, but for, for because they say this is our culture. We want to maintain our culture e in a world where there are lots of other kinds of information, lots of other kinds of cultural inputs come into their lives. So yes, there's a, there's a great concerned. I, when we did this uh, future of the internet work, I often was with Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web. He and I did radio programs and we did um, other kinds of forums because last year was the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Uh, he, he, when Tim Berners-Lee created the software for computers to figure out what files were going on, it was in 1989 when he was at the CERN lab in Switzerland about that. So, so there are, he's very concerned that the, that the future of the web will be much more restricted and much more locked down and, uh, and that the technology community won't be able to um, take advantage of all of the wonderful freedom of the internet. I don't want to sound like too nerdy, but uh, a lot of discussion these days is about uh, that we don't have web the web anymore because we are uh, inside apps and and maybe that that's a, a debate uh, going on uh, especially in the news organization so i know uh, sorry paolo uh, we have this rule we don't we don't discuss every year the future of journalism but this i, I can ask you this uh, is the web uh, still a currency and and uh, a point of access if someone and uh, most, uh, we uh, you obviously uh, uh, saw that research about uh, Indonesia if I'm not wrong uh, saying that people who were on Facebook uh, felt that was the internet yes so. yes D so in the research community especially in the international arena researchers have discovered that they cannot just ask people, do you use the internet? Because not everyone who should say yes does say yes. So they asked to ask a separate question of everybody, do you have a smartphone, do you use Facebook? And a lot of people say yes to Facebook and no to internet. So yes, that's part of the example of how the internet fades to the background, the point that those experts were making in the slide that I showed. The rise of the apps universe is um, an interesting thing for all sorts of media and knowledge enterprises because some people liked the wide open, crazy, searchable World Wide Web, but some people were confused by it. They, weren't, they didn't necessarily know how to navigate. They didn't necessarily know how to rely on certain kinds of information. So the apps world, if you download the app for a news organization or a knowledge enterprise or a, a technology company, you are saying, I like what they are. I like what they give me. I trust what they give me. So there's been a struggle throughout the life of the internet and especially the web about trust. How do you build it in an environment when anyone can reach anyone else who has a connection? And there are all sorts of interesting ways that humans have innovated and technologists have innovated to build trust into these systems and apps are one way to do it. When we asked about apps versus the web in an expert survey three years ago, Many people said, don't worry too much about that because in the world of the protocols of HTML5, there will be not that much distinction. You will have a wonderful app-like experience on a website. 
And when we actually, when we, I'll tell you a little research story. We, um, these are wonderful tools for doing research. You can get people to answer questions. You can learn from the data on their phones about who they are and what they've been. And we asked people to download a survey app onto their smartphones so that we could send them surveys. And many people who are on our panel of, of, of uh, just regular citizens struggled to download the app. And they much preferred just to use their web browser to take the surveys. So all of this excitement or concern about apps, it's still not something that the general population well understands, even in an advanced technology society like America. So it's, it, we're still feeling our way through this environment. So it, it just has journalists well, worrying journalists are about excited. this. Yeah, yeah. Okay, journalists okay. are excited. I see, I and journalists, I used to be a journalist. And I, um, it's, it's a hard thing to watch what's happened to the best journalistic enterprises around the world as their business model has been very challenged. And there are, there's really interesting research in America, and I'm sure it's true around the world, that especially as newspapers um, are challenged and cut back their coverage or turn exclusively to digital um, platforms or shut down because they just cannot make a living, what happens is very destructive to communities because lots of the most important civic information in communities starts with newspapers. It's like the fundamental um, food of, of an ecosystem that it, without the newspaper saying what's happening in the mayor's office, or with school officials, or with social services, or with transportation, the local bloggers and radio stations and TV stations do not have the raw material that they need to do their storytelling. So I, I feel this concern, or I understand this concern sort of very personally. <laughs> we all do. Thank you, thank you. Um, I have I have lots of questions to go on, but uh, if you want to uh, raise your hand, please uh, start thinking about uh, Paolo and Sergio. You two can think about the question. The the next one will will be about uh, geography. Uh, you, you put us on a map before. Um, uh, some years ago, uh, the, there was a huge debate uh, in Italy and uh, I guess in the US as well um, uh, about a book from an Italian researcher working in Berkeley, um, Enrico Moretti is his name, and he wrote a, a book um, about the new way of jobs around the world. And the, the, the title was The New Geography of the Jobs. Um, and in his book, the, the research claimed to, uh, to say that geography is still relevant to, to, to your career, to find your job, and, and to, to improve your life. Uh, but looking at, at, at the numbers and, and the clusters of, of the different area of the world, maybe, uh, and, and thinking about virtual reality and, and other things, geography will, it's a question, it's not a, <laughs> I'm not saying this, geography can be less relevant because uh, we can work uh, uh, really, and, and be relevant uh, to, to a place without being there. So, uh, what's your view on this point? I, I think that that is likely to be the case, according to those experts that we were talking to. At the time, we released a report about the future of jobs, and we were not asking about geography, but we were asking about the impact of artificial intelligence and robotics. At the time, we, and I'll tell you about that survey. So. Most times when we do these surveys, we kind of know what the answers will be. We know where the experts will anticipate change and will worry about things. But we did not know. We, we, our question was, by the year 2025, so 10 years from now, will artificial intelligence and robotics have destroyed more jobs than they created or will have made more jobs than they destroyed? Half the experts said, one thing, half said the other. It was a completely split verdict, and there were economists, there were technologists, there were other scholars in this group, so they don't know, really, or they, they certainly don't agree 
on what the future is. And at the time we released that report, a report came out from two scholars at Oxford who looked at American jobs and projected uh, the impact of robotics and artificial intelligence on American jobs and said that in the next generation, 47%, half of jobs, will be challenged or wiped out by technology change. So part of that is a geography story. Now, if you have an x-ray or an MRI done of you, that can be read not by a local radiologist, but can, by, by a wonderful radiologist on the other side of the world who maybe charges less and, uh, and maybe is more efficient for your organization to use. Uh, so, so the locality of that kind of job doesn't matter as much. But some jobs need you physically to be there and the worker to physically be there. It's hard to have a, a, an avatar cut your hair. Um, but there will be fewer of those jobs. And one of the most striking things that will happen in the future is that our sense of being present, of being physically with someone, will radically change. When we have this amazing bandwidth that we are getting in cities now that are getting gigabit bandwidth, and uh, when, in artificial, uh, with the goggles that are now on sale, uh, Google Cardboard, and then this Christmas, we will be able to buy Oculus Rift goggles. We will be able to have a very close to real experience with someone wherever they are. So our sense of being where we are will radically change in a world where we can be anywhere and be in very close um, contact with someone even if they are not physically with us. So I think geography matters less. Um, probably over time because lots of jobs that depend uh, now on physical presence will not necessarily depend on it. So w what about trust? Uh, because we love to go to, to a doctor we, we knew from where we were yeah. like very uh, little boys and because <laughs> And we, we already have trip advisors for doctors, but uh, given that many times uh, the best restaurant in the city is, a, I don't know, a, a, an ice cream shop, uh, <laughs> what, what about doctors? Well, how, how, you can how easily can see a blended world where your local contact, your local expert is your portal is your gateway to other experts. So you do have a very trusted relationship with a doctor, with a favorite journalist, with a neighbor who knows a lot about how to be a good citizen in your community. But the, the network effect uh, that will take place for your local portal is that your doctor can access the best doctor in the world for the thing your doctor does not understand about you. So my sense is that we will always depend at, at some level on local trust, but in really interesting ways, the technology community and the social environment uh, enabled by new technology comes up with all sorts of interesting ways to build trust. So think about those, um, those Yelp reviews. It, you, you know, the, one of the challenges of the early internet was, sure, you could find out any restaurant in your community or community you were visiting, but you had no idea whether they were good or bad, whether they served toxic food or really great food. But all, soon enough, the recommendations of strangers began to fill up those systems. And now people treat the recommendations of strangers and the reviews of strangers and the upvotes of strangers as a really important indicator of whether a person has trust. And you, there's a mutuality to these systems too now. So think about Uber or Airbnb, where I rent my room to you, you can rank whether I gave you a good room or not, and I can rank whether you were a great guest or not. So the next person who rents you a room, or the next room you go to see, the, the people will have additional information about whether you are trustworthy or not. There, there will be discussion this afternoon, David has promised, on uh, uh, chain breaks. And, um, and there are ways now that the technology community is 
figuring out how to use algorithms and computing power to build trust into relationships that have been very challenging for trust in the future. So it's the most important thing. Societies are in much better shape if they trust each other. Some of the most interesting work on that actually has been done in Italy. And the differences between northern and southern Italy are often tied to social capital differences between northern and southern Italy. And so we're figuring out ways that we can trust each other and meet each other and begin to know who each other are, that's a really important part of this new global environment. I see. Um, I have some two last questions. Um, talking about trust, um, perception is, is, is key. Yeah. Because otherwise you can't uh, tell what, what yeah. are you seeing. Um, and talking about perception, uh, I'd like to, to, to go on politics. Um, what's going on in, in the US? You have a, a broad polarization, m m much uh, worrying than the Italian, let's say. And uh, how can uh, the social media, the, your first revolution, uh, influence or not uh, the, the coming campaign uh, that, that is, is relevant, I, yeah. I guess. Uh, well, I will talk about America because our, the Pew data are very important and very clear on this. There is very serious polarization going on, and it's not just related to politics. So, so Republicans and Democrats have increasingly divided views on issues that relate to them. But now polarization is leaking, seeping into people's personal lives. So they are now telling us in our data that I do not want to live next to someone who does not share my political views. I do not my ch want my child hanging out with other children whose families have different views. More and more people are now saying that the people who have different views, they're not just wrong. That's always been the case. If someone doesn't agree with you, you think they're wrong. What's happening now is Americans are saying to each other, their views are destructive to the culture. Their, rule, rule, their views will ruin our country if they are embraced. So there's a sense that people do not even want to talk to each other and, and increasingly in the media environment don't necessarily share the same facts. There's talk about a filter bubble, right? I live in the bubble that I've created of the information streams and political information and other things that I believe in. You might live right next door to me and live in a completely different bubble. And so we hardly have anything to talk about. Okay. It's, so it's, there's concern about that. What's, what's more, the reality is that people who, are, who really care about politics, who are really interested in news and political information and the political culture, they know views that oppose theirs, but the reason that they learn those views is because they want to develop arguments against the other one. They don't want to change their minds, or they're not necessarily open to new information, but they need to know what the other side believes so that they can win the argument with them. <laughs> I see. Um... Thank you. Um, my, my, last my last question, and then if you have some. Okay, so I'll pick my last one after. Thank you very much, first of all, for your presentation. You. And um, you were mentioning uh, Tim Berner Lee uh, invented the web and they gave for free to the world. Uh, we are seeing what's happening on the USA on patent uh, dispute. I mean, uh, there are a lot of uh, patent uh, uh, act in court, uh, and that maybe is stiffing the competition and the innovation. Uh, do you have any data on the impact of all these uh, uh, patent issue in the USA and how uh, this impact on the uh, open web? I do not have information on that, and it's what is maybe I. There are other researchers in the room who can fact check me on this. I think it's the case that there are now more patents being issued than ever before. And one of the things that concerns the technology community is that the patents are 
too simple and they are not for real innovation, that they are just for minor changes in existing rules and people are able to, um, to close down innovation because they have just gotten a little increment of change. So I think there is some economic uh, research that suggests that that's a problem, but, uh, but for just the scale of innovation, I think that uh, the American data on patents are more is taking place now than has ever uh, been the case. Am I, are there other researchers who maybe know uh, that? But people are very concerned that the, that, um, that the legal regime of innovation is, is, makes it hard uh, sometimes to, to, to do that. Another one? Yeah, the mic is coming. Uh, you mentioned before the, um, the gap in between the uh, human uh, and uh, organiz human organizations and the technology. And then uh, the case of, um, of the doctor is, is, uh, is the case. I mean, you may find the best doctor in the world, but uh, how it would be uh, dealt or paid by the insurance and yeah. the yeah. Uh, the health system, uh, social, social system. That yeah. has to be built. That's a perfect example of the point that many of these experts in our survey describe where human institutions do not respond as rapidly as technology change enables. So I'll, you will probably see class differences in the system that I described. If my doctor, if I can pay my doctor to access the brilliant Italian doctor who can diagnose and treat my problem, great if I can pay for it. But if, if a poorer American doesn't have the insurance capacity, yeah. So there, it, it relates to two things. I mean, society changing at the same pace as technology and whether, you know, the, there are now new ways that relatively well-off people can take advantage of these new things that um, poorer people can't. So it's, it's a problem. It's, look at the struggle that cities are having over Uber. How do we apply rules that we, you know, there's a regime in our city for how, how many taxis there are, where they can go, how they are insured, what their relationship is with the central company that employs them. With Uber, all of those rules have to be reimagined, or Uber is challenging them, and there are such struggles. It's part of the American political campaign now. Some candidates think that's great. Other candidates think Uber is uh, more of a problem than not. And, and so you can just watch as cultures struggle with how these disruptions circle through their systems. Thank you. My, my, my last one. Uh, I'm not sure we have time. Uh, okay, one. Uh, up there. Yeah. So, um, I would like to ask market-wise um, the relationship um, site uh, HTML5, HTML5 against app. I mean. Uh, it seems that apps in the market seems that apps grant more fidelization to the companies, so they want that. But um, as a young developers, developer, I, I, would, I would lean on the HTML5. So do you have any data <laughs> uh, that support one or the other? No, I'm, uh, I don't have any data on that. I think what a lot of technologists would argue is that in the long run, open always beats closed. Uh, and that, that spreading out and making available, the, the, you know, the more open you are and the more you share, the better off you end up being. But that, you know, for companies that have to make money, it, that's, that's not an easy question. But I, I'm sorry, I do not have data on that. So my, my last one. Um, we talked about numbers and, and the state of the art of, of the internet, uh, but of course you were invited to tell us the future. So <laughs> you, uh, you had three revolutions in your keynote. Uh, what's the fourth? 
the fourth, well, the broad fourth will be the Internet of Things, that all of these smart and connected devices will um, change the way that we buy things, change the way that businesses operate, change the way that we buy things, change the way that we walk through um, our lives. And so that, but it, 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 actually the Internet of Things is many things. And so you can see that um, virtual reality with these goggles that will be on sale this holiday season, that will begin to change the way that we relate to each other. Drones will, and self-driving cars or, or highly connected cars will uh, change things rather quickly. The other thing to watch, um, two big institutions have not been affected by the internet as much as other institutions like news. One is education, the other is healthcare. So it'll be interesting to watch how Finally, digital technology comes to uh, be embraced by the health community. Sometimes insurance issues will dictate what gets accepted and, and what doesn't. But education, uh, particularly after the Great Recession, many people now have a sense that they need to learn throughout their lives. And they need to prepare throughout their lives for what's coming ahead. So it will be interesting to watch the marketplace as well as public institutions try to change the, the offerings or the change the things that they offer to people to take account of that big change in their heads. So we should be smarter in the future. <laughs> so we, uh, well, the pressure will be on everyone to be smarter. If you're not smarter, you're in trouble. <laughs> be safe. Thank you, so. Thank you, Lee.